Happy Monday, listeners. For Scientific American Science Quickly, I'm Rachel Feltman. Let's kick off the week with a quick roundup of some of the latest science news. First, a public health update from one of our colleagues at Scientific American, Senior Health Editor Josh Fishman. He's here to fill us in on an ongoing outbreak of the chikungunya virus in China. So what has happened here is that in June, China started reporting a spike in cases of chikungunya. And China is having a fast rising outbreak in a place that has never had one before. These are centered on the southern province of Guangdong and its city of Foshan, that's near Hong Kong. And by the beginning of August, they were up to 7,000 cases. In 2025, about 240,000 cases and 90 deaths have been reported in 16 different countries and territories, and that's just through July. The chikungunya virus was first identified in Africa in 1952. The name comes from a Makande word, uh, that's a language spoken in Tanzania, that means to bend up. And it refers to the most prominent symptoms, which are really, really painful joints that distort your posture and contort you into uncomfortable positions. In addition, it causes a fever and rashes. And these things are usually short-lived. They take a week or two to get over. Sometimes, though, they can continue for years. And sometimes chikungunya can cause heart damage. The virus is carried by two mosquito species, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. And people can get sick within three to seven days of a bite. And what worries me a little bit is that chikungunya moves really easily in this age of fast global travel. There are already outbreaks in France and in Italy and cases reported in the U.S. Experts say that people in the United States should be a little concerned. There are, however, limiting factors that should minimize worry spraying insecticides and eliminating mosquito areas. And in a temperate area, like most of the United States, the first killing frost will get rid of the insects and that stops viral transmission. However, if you do get bitten and get sick, there are no good antiviral therapies. There's no specific treatment for chikungunya. And this is important if you're traveling to affected areas where there are big outbreaks. There are two effective and Food and Drug Administration approved vaccines that get the body to produce antibodies. And these both lower the risk of infection. And pretty fortunately, insect repellents and protective clothing work pretty well. Now for some climate news. Last Tuesday, officials in Juneau, Alaska, confirmed a glacial outburst at Suicide Basin, a lake about 10 miles from the city center that's attached to the Mendenhall Glacier. A glacial lake outburst flood, also known as a GLOF, is a rapid, unpredictable flood caused by the sudden drainage of a glacial lake. As glaciers melt, which is happening faster these days thanks to climate change, some of their water forms so-called glacial lakes. They're often dammed up naturally by glacial ice or by rocks and soil left behind as the glacier melts. But as meltwater levels rise, they can overflow the natural dam or even bust right through it. Suicide Basin has been a regular site of outburst floods since 2011, but the annual gloffs have gotten worse each year since 2023. By last Wednesday morning, the Mendenhall River had entered the major flood stage. Floodwaters had receded by that same evening, but only after reaching a peak of 16.65 feet. That's more than half a foot higher than last year's peak flooding, which broke previous records. 
Local officials said that a set of temporary barriers placed along the river earlier this year, along with close monitoring and early warnings to the public, kept flooding of homes, schools, and businesses to a minimum. The Alaska Beacon reported that no overnight rescues or emergency evacuations had been required, and that flood damage was limited to one bridge and some seepage of water into homes and yards. In contrast, last year's floods caused major damage to 64 homes, and some residents had to swim to safety or be rescued by boat. In other science news, a study published in Nature last Wednesday describes the remains of an entirely new species of human ancestor. The fossils, which date back to around 2.8 to 2.6 million years ago, belong to a new member of the genus Australopithecus, meaning this species is a cousin of the famous Lucy. The species doesn't have a formal name yet because researchers are hoping to find more fossils first. The new study is based on only a handful of teeth collected in Ethiopia. But even with just a few chompers to go on, the researchers say they're confident they've got a new hominin on their hands. The news is particularly exciting because of something else the researchers found at the same site. Teeth from a member of our own Homo genus. That means this new flavor of Australopithecus could have lived alongside close relatives of ours. And speaking of human origins, in a study published last Friday in the journal Science Advances, researchers report capturing the process of human embryo implantation in three dimensions in real time. The researchers note that we already knew that embryos had to burrow into uterine tissue in order to successfully implant, but that most studies have focused on the genetic and biochemical aspects of this stage of conception instead of examining the mechanical process. Scientists from the Institute for Bioengineering of Catalonia in Spain created experimental platforms made of collagen designed to mimic the tissue of the uterine lining. They created systems to use with both human cells and mouse cells. When they introduced mouse embryos to their artificial uterus, the embryos exerted force to press themselves against the surface. Then the uterus adapted by folding its cellular matrix around the embryo to envelop it. Human embryos acted differently, burrowing into the uterine tissue to penetrate it. The researchers also saw signs that the embryos could sense and react to mechanical forces from their environment, as well as from other nearby embryos. Previous research suggests that between one-third and half of all fertilized eggs fail to fully implant, so a better understanding of the mechanical process could help address some cases of infertility. Let's cap things off with a fun animal story. According to a study published last Tuesday in the journal Discover Animals, dolphins and whales have been hanging out together without us. Researchers studied nearly 200 different video clips of whales and dolphins interacting with each other, spanning across 20 years and 17 countries. They found that six types of whales and 13 species of dolphins seemed to interact socially. Humpback whales and bottlenose dolphins were particularly prone to indulging in interspecies hangs, and the most common interaction involved dolphins swimming alongside a whale's snout. They may be engaging in a practice known as bow riding, which is where dolphins use the pressure fronts created by ships or large whales so that they can swim faster. The researchers believe that dolphins may seek whales out for stimulation or play, and that whales may sometimes reciprocate. That's all for this week's News Roundup. We'll be back on Wednesday to talk about the surprising sexual diversity of the animal kingdom. Science Quickly is produced by me, Rachel Feltman, along with Fonda Mwangi, Kelso Harper, and Jeff Delvisio. This episode was edited by Alex Seguiera. Emily Mikowski, Shayna Poses, and Aaron Shattuck fact check our show. Our theme music was composed by Dominic Smith. Subscribe to Scientific American for more up-to-date and in-depth science news. For Scientific American, this is Rachel Feltman. Have a great week.